Good morning, and welcome to the new era of <laughs> here we go, the new era of Smarter Food Safety Summit on e-commerce. I'm Mike Kaczynski. This is our third day of this uh, wonderful uh, event. Uh, today, I'd like to, you know, once again remind everybody that you can submit written comments, and we highly encourage it. You see the link below, and I don't expect you to memorize all of that. But what I do expect is that if you look in the uh, description right in the on the YouTube page, you can see that link, and you can provide comments at any time. Also, we'd love for you to, uh, if you do want to treat, uh, tweet or share information about this socially, to use our hashtag SmarterFoodSafety. Now, we will have a, today Q&A will be a little bit different, but we do want you to submit your questions again during that portion to our Smarter Food Safety at FDA.HHS mailbox. So please, like I said, any questions you may have, please submit them. Now, to talk about you, the people that are participating, and again, each day we've been watching our numbers uh, climb as this event has been shared around the world and the different industries that have been participating. Right now, as we speak, uh, 44 countries initially participated. Now we're up to uh, 49 countries that have participated, and we've had more than uh, 8,000 participa individual participants uh, each day or overall. So I can't thank you enough for joining us and also for sharing this. So please, if you're interested in the whole series, you can go to the FDA uh, YouTube site or go to our, our webpage again at at New Era Smarter Food Safety uh, Summit on e-commerce, and all the videos and content will be shared there. So at this time, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Carrie Barrett, who will be the moderator or co-moderator for today. Carrie, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Michael, and good morning again to everyone. And my, as Michael said, this is our third and final day of the summit. Today, we are going to uh, focus on uh, perspectives of e-commerce and food safety, ensuring business-to-consumer e-commerce models produce, sell, and transport safe food. And we'll be doing this by inviting in a number of international speakers, um, our, our government partners from around the world. So it's a very exciting day, a little bit of a different twist. And again, I'm Carrie Barrett and co-moderating along with Michael. And uh, we have really covered so much uh, ground over the last two days, and today will be no exception to that. So um, again, we want to, as Michael said, remind everybody we're really excited about your written public comments. And uh, also want to remind you on our website, there is a one-pager on how to submit comments if you're unfamiliar with the process. It gives a docket number as well as the date uh, for when comments are due. So again, I just want to let you know that reference is there. And uh, at this time, I'm going to hand the program over again to our summit host, Andreas Keller. Andreas, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you, Kay. And welcome for, to all my colleagues around the globe. It is a pleasure to be here in this third day and final day of our summit. And as my colleague said and mentioned, there's much more to come today. And specifically, we we'll talk about international topics in B2C e-commerce. I want to take a little time to recap, to capture what we talked about yesterday when we heard how important and valuable it is to work together in ensuring the safety of foods produced and sold through B2C e-commerce. Each of the sessions involved the industry consumers, and regulators. They gave specific insight and perspective on the work that could be done to improve the safety of foods produced, sold, delivered through B2C e-commerce and where we are having a positive impact already. Some highlights from yesterday and very worthy to mention are we had an overview of how FDA, USDA, state, and local partners oversee B2C e-commerce and the challenges and opportunities they face, the importance of collaboration among federal and state and local regulators, the need to have flexibility in any new standards which might need to be developed due to constant change of food delivery models and the need to foster innovation, the differences in how animal food is regulated and what that could mean to animal food sold and delivered via B2C e-commerce the need for accessible and accurate labeling information of food sold via 
e-commerce, and how technologies such as artificial intelligence and temperature sensors can help ensure the safety of food sold through B2C e-commerce. All of us might think more about the constantly evolving landscape of B2C e-commerce and the opportunities we have to work together and collaborate to ensure the safety of foods. As noted previously, today we will immerse ourselves into the international regulatory approaches used by B2C e-commerce and foods. Our lead speakers this morning will explain and share their perspectives on how Brazil, Germany, Japan, Wales, and the United States of America manage international regulations on e-commerce and food safety. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Judy McMeekin. Dr. Judy McMeekin is the Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs in the Office of Regulatory Affairs at FDA, also known as ORA. She oversees approximately 5,000 ORA staff stationed in the United States and around the world. As the FDA's lead office for regulatory field activities, ORA is at the forefront of protecting public health for today's complex global regulatory environment. ORA partners with FDA product centers throughout inspection, criminal investigations, compliance, enforcement, import operations, field and laboratory operations, among other areas. Before joining the FDA, Dr. McMeekin worked for the United States Pharmacopeia and served as a clinical pharmacist in several health systems. Following Dr. McMeekin, we'll hear from Mark Abdu. Mark Abdu is the Associate Commissioner for Global Policy and Strategy at FDA. He provides executive oversight, strategic leadership, and policy direction to FDA's global operations, trade and diplomacy activities, and engagement with international stakeholders expanding the reach of FDA's global agenda in sustainable and measurable ways. Mr. Abdu joined FDA in 2013. Prior to joining FDA, he served as Senior Advisor for Food Security and Agricultural Economics at the U.S. Agency for International Development, also known as USAID. And he was the Director for Global Health and Food Safety at the National Security Council staff at the White House. I will now turn the program over to Dr. McKinnon and Mr. Abdu. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day three of our new ERA Summit on e-commerce. It is my honor to represent the Office of Regulatory Affairs, or ORA, the FDA's lead office for all regulatory field activities. We handle a range of mission-critical work, including inspections, investigations, sample collection and analyses, examinations of imported products, recalls, and enforcement. The FDA supports retail food protection in many ways, including the development of the FDA Food Code and the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program Standards. We also provide technical assistance, standardization, and training to our regulatory partners who are so important in our mission to protect public health. We all know the COVID-19 pandemic has required us to do many things differently, but through it all, ORA has been on duty ensuring the safety of food, drugs, and medical products. We've continued to conduct mission critical and prioritized inspections, make decisions on imported products, conduct sample analyses in our laboratories, and provide technical support to retail food regulatory partners through our retail food specialists. We've also seen the pandemic change how consumers behave and how industry operates. So we've taken steps to adapt. We have seen a significant transformation in the area of retail food. Updated approaches are needed based on the demands placed on the supply chain from marketplace imbalances to a rise in e-commerce. We are especially interested in stakeholder feedback on the regulatory oversight for the last mile of retail. 
without our federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, as well as trade associations and industry, we cannot fully achieve our mission to protect public health. This is especially relevant since we work with our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners through cooperative programs to ensure the retail sector is regulated consistently across the nation. It's important to stay nimble to ensure a strong food safety system and in collaboration with our partners, keep all Americans safe from during any crisis. This is why the FDA developed the new era of Smarter Food Safety Blueprint, which outlines a path forward and builds on the work we've done through the Food Safety Modernization Act. In February of this year, ORA launched the second phase of the agency's Artificial Intelligence Seafood Pilot Program as part of the new era of Smarter Food Safety to leverage the use of machine learning. This is especially important since the U.S. imports about 94% of its seafood supply. Artificial intelligence will help quickly identify imported products that may pose a threat to public health. Looking at more traditional business models, ORA is firmly committed to invest, investing in new era's modernization efforts to help ensure the safety of foods sold at restaurants and other retail establishments. This includes supporting our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners through our retail flexible funding model. The model is a cooperative agreement program that reinforces our efforts to modernize the nation's retail food protection program under the New Era Initiative. We're also very proud to be part of the Retail Food Safety Regulatory Association Collaborative which aims to leverage the resources and strengths of national retail food safety associations to advance retail food protection and reduce foodborne illness. Members are the Association of Food and Drug Officials, the National Environmental Health Association, the Conference for Food Protection, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and the FDA. The new era element of smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response includes domestic mutual reliance, which enables the FDA and states with comparable public health systems to work with and rely on each other for a safer national food supply. We are seeing more and more collaboration with the states and sharing of information. A strong regulatory partnership model is critical to protecting the public, particularly during these unprecedented times where consumer behaviors have changed. And while we've continued our oversight duties, there's no doubt that the pandemic has impacted our inspectional work. In the spirit of transparency for our partners and the people that we serve, in May, we released the Resiliency Roadmap for FDA Inspectional Oversight Report. The roadmap, a result of collaboration between ORA and our FDA colleagues, details the pandemic's effect on our inspectional activities for each regulated commodity and our plan for a more consistent state of operations. It also shows how we're addressing postponed inspections based on risk. Recently, we've been able to complete more than 3,600 previously postponed surveillance assignments. Inspections will always be an essential part of our operations, but we've also learned during the pandemic the value in the multiple approaches available to us to assess safety, quality, and compliance. For example, in addition to enhancing our partnerships, we're using voluntary remote regulatory assessments. Overall, we've heard positive feedback from firms, and we look forward to exploring this approach more. I'd also like to thank the firms that participated in the remote regulatory assessment Human Foods Pilot. The current challenges have presented opportunities to reassess how we work. We'll continue to invest in collaborative efforts 
to achieve our shared goal of protecting the American people. We look forward to our continued work with you. Thank you again for your leadership and partnership and shared commitment to public health. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I want to extend a warm welcome to the many international attendees participating in our virtual summit and to especially thank the five international regulators who agreed to carve some time out of their busy schedules to join today's panel discussion. Our conversations over the past few days have given us an opportunity to examine both what we are doing and what more we might do to enhance food safety in the rapidly expanding business to consumer e-commerce food market. As a point of reference, online food ordering, meal kits, and delivery services take in around $100 billion a year worldwide, and demand is still growing, according to McKinsey and company. Since e-commerce powerhouses exist throughout the world, today we are turning our focus to get an international perspective on retail food safety. In particular, we'll be hearing about what approaches regulators in Japan, Brazil, Wales, Germany, and Canada are using to oversee the business to consumer e-commerce businesses engaged in producing, selling, and transporting food. Identifying opportunities for enhanced food safety in new business models and other forward-thinking approaches embodied under the new era blueprint have one goal in mind, bending the curve of foodborne illness. But given today's interconnected supply chains, the United States can't achieve that food safety goal alone. After all, 13% of the total U.S. food supply comes from other countries, and the market share from imports is higher in certain product categories such as fresh fruit, vegetables, and seafood. I'm sure many of our international colleagues who are here today confront similar or even more complex food supply chains. And with new technologies that facilitate direct-to-consumer con purchasing of food from anywhere in the world, additional challenges are emerging. FDA believes that ensuring food safety is not only a domestic imperative, but a global imperative. Several years ago, we asked the World Bank to put dollar figures around the impact of unsafe foods on the global economy. In a 2018 report, the bank concluded that unsafe food undermines food and nutritional security, human development, the broader food economy, and international trade. Looking at the effects on low and middle income countries, the bank estimated that foodborne disease was responsible for total productivity loss of $95.2 billion each year, and the annual cost of treating foodborne illness was $15 billion a year for those countries. However, as the international community adopts the four core elements of the new era blueprint, traceability, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response, fostering food safety culture, and retail modernization, including ensuring the safety of food produced and delivered using new business models, we believe substantial progress will be made in strengthening food safety practices around the globe. Since FDA rolled out its New Era Blueprint, we've been hearing about public and private entities throughout the world that are engaged in a variety of initiatives that are intended to move towards a smarter food safety future. Although these initiatives go beyond today's topic of e-commerce, they are important to mention because they show the number of people across the globe who are thinking about new ways to improve food safety. In June, we launched the new era of smarter food safety, low or no cost tech enabled traceability challenge. This no low challenge, as it's been called, was designed to innovate cost effective ways to track food from source to table. Better traceability helps us to respond to food outbreaks more quickly and therefore protects more consumers from illness. To our surprise and delight, our 90 contest submissions came from many countries. We believe that by getting creative, as we did with the NOLO challenge, we will create a more digital, traceable, and safer food system. It will be a system that advances food safety, 
better prepares us for unexpected events that could put it at risk, and overall improves the trust consumers and the United States and all over the world have in us, whether we're regulators or private industry, to ensure safe food for themselves and their families. This summit focuses on food sold directly from businesses to consumers using e-commerce. As we will learn today from our regulatory colleagues, this is a topic that crosses borders. We want to learn as much as possible to determine the best way to keep consumers safe, whether they order their food from a shop nearby or from sources around the world. FDA will be collaborating with the international community over the next few years to build awareness about this issue and our broader New Era vision. Our intent is to lay the foundation for strategic engagement that will advance food safety priorities in the United States and across the globe. FDA will engage with international food safety stakeholders by working with foreign regulators and industry stakeholders through capacity development, efforts such as training and webinar series, conference participation, and public meetings on particular topics like this one. We've opened a public docket for this meeting, and we urge all of our stakeholders, including our international stakeholders, to provide us with information and insights by submitting written comments to the docket about business to consumer e-commerce. The docket will remain open until November 20th. We will use this information from the docket, from the meeting, and from all of our engagements to determine our path forward. We aim to cooperate with our colleagues, not only providing information, but seeking input on other systems approaches to risk management, regulation, and enhancing food safety practices so that together we can all bend the curve on foodborne illness. Thank you. What a pleasure to hear from our FDA senior leaders, Judy McMeekin and Mark Abadou. Thank you so much for helping us kick off the third day of our new era of Smarter Food Safety Summit on e-commerce. At this time, we will now turn to our international regulatory panel with Julie Moss as our moderator. Julie, take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Moss, and I'll be moderating today's panel session titled International Regulatory Perspectives on E-Commerce and Food Safety, Regulatory Framework and Oversight. I'm the Director for International Affairs in the FDA Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, where I'm responsible for international engagement activities involving the safety of import and export of foods and cosmetics, as well as global nutrition issues. As a reminder, the purpose of this summit is to engage with stakeholders like yourselves and invite input on various topics pertaining to the implementation of Core Element 3.1, New Business Models and Retail Modernization of the New Era of Smarter Food Safety Blueprint. We intend to use information resulting from the public meeting to determine what action, if any, should be taken to help ensure the safe production and delivery of foods sold through new e-commerce business models. It's my pleasure to moderate the next panel session. We are fortunate to have with us some very accomplished panel members from around the world. For this particular session, we pre-recorded all the presentations and follow-up Q&A. Our panelists for this afternoon are Dr. Akira Miki with the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan, Mr. Fabio Miranda de Rocha with the National Health Surveillance Agency, or known as Anvisa, in Brazil. Ms. Julie Pierce with the Food Standards Agency in the United Kingdom. Dr. George Schreiber with the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety in Germany. You can find more information about these panelists in the bios document on the FDA New Era Summit website. As background on this specific panel, all parts of the world are experiencing an explosion of business-to-consumer food shopping practices similar to the United States. I did some research and wanted to share a few statistics. Analyzed by geography in 2020, 
China represented the world's largest online food delivery market in revenue. The United States ranked as the second largest market. India is the third largest globally with the United Kingdom and Brazil following. I'll note that the Asia Pacific region not only accounts for the majority of worldwide sales, it also is seen as an innovative hub, pointing the way forward for other regions of the world. In my research, I found that China, South Korea, Japan, and India were cited as top markets in that region. For the European region, Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, and the UK were top markets. It is expected that Germany will triple its e-commerce food market in the coming years, and the UK is expected to maintain its high ranking globally. This international panel will begin to inform us at the FDA about the regulatory e-commerce considerations by other countries of the world. They have a wealth of food safety oversight, data sharing experiences, and knowledge about trade and the commerce of safe food. I suspect we'll learn a lot. With that, let's get started with our first panelist. He is Dr. Akira Nikki. He is the Director for the Food Inspection and Safety Division within the Bureau for Pharmaceutical Safety and Environmental Health in Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. Over to you, Dr. Mickey. え、この5年間に食品のB2C、EC の市場規模、EC化率ともに年々伸びており、5年前と比べると2020年は市場規模EC化率ともに5年前の約1.5倍の伸びを示しております。特に新型コロナ感染症COVID-19が発生した2020年の伸び率は感染症対策として政府が人と人との接触を減らすことを推奨したこととも背景となっています。このような状況の中で日本がB2CECを通じた食品を含む食品の安全確保をどのように行っている
、まあ、自治体の方にですね届け出をするということになっている,なっている仕組みです。でまあ、自治体に届け出された情報については、まあ、健康被害が起こる可能性に合わせてこの分類1から、まあ、分類3に分けられて厚生労働省のホームページで公表をされます消費者や B2C、EC を通じて販売を行っている事業者はこのホームページを見ることで今どのような食品がリコールをされているのかその食品を摂取した場合の健康被害の程度はどのような程度なのかということを知ることができます。現在、この制度については施行後約5ヶ月が経つ、経ちますけれども、B2C、EC を通じた販売を行った食品の監修は、全体約700件ぐらいのうちの大体 21, 21件ということで、約 3% が該当をしております。このスライドについては、特に輸入食品に関する安全性の確保についてご紹介をしたものであります。日本は麦類、豆類をはじめとする穀物や肉類、乳製品といった多くの食品を輸入しており、重量では約年間5000万トン、生産額ベースでは約3割を輸入に頼っている輸入大国であります。このため、輸入食品の安全性に対する国民の関心は非常に高く、輸入食品の安全性確保は重要な課題というふうになっております。このため、日本に食品を輸入しようとする事業者は、輸入の都度、検疫所に届け出が必要となっております。届け出された食品は、検疫所の食品衛生監視員により、審査、必要により検査が行われて、食品衛法上問題がないということを確認した後に輸入を認めていますさらに食肉や食肉製品乳製品といった特定の食品についての、まあ、輸出国政府が発行した衛生証明書が輸入時に必要となっているほか、まあ、食,品を食肉を輸入する場合にはあらかじめ国または施設の指定が必要となっていますこのように食品安全に問題がある食品が輸入されないよう、水際でチェックを行っています。また、FDA や EU のラッシュ等の情報により、海外でリコールされている食品が日本に輸入されているということが判明した場合には、消費者に対する注意喚起などを行っています。表に示すのは、海外でのリコール情報をもとに、国内で対応した事例となってございますが、2016年にサプリメントのリコールがありましたけれども、これについては、海外から B2CC を通じて購入していた消費者も多いというふうに思われたということで、厚生労働省のホームページで、自治体や事業者を通じて、まあ、購入した消費者に対しての注意喚起を行っています。まあ、こういった形で、まあ、国内外を問わず、食品安全上の問題を有する食品にかかる情報が、まあ、迅速かつ正確に入手をされ、まあ、事業者等が、まあ、その情報を共有できるようにするというようなことが大切だというふうに考えています。次に、日本の食品事業者の B2C、EC への取り組みについてご紹介をいたします。日本を代表するいくつかの食品事業者は、昨今の COVID-19 の状況等も踏まえ、B2C、EC に積極的に取り組んでいます。店舗での実販売と B2C、EC を通じた販売の流れについて図で例示をいたしました。店舗販売の場合には、小売店舗での衛生管理を行政が確認することに加え、消費者も購入時の食品の衛生状態を確認することができます。一方で、E2C、BC の場合には、配送段階の衛生管理の確認というのが難しいことに加え、消費者は届いた食品の衛生状態しか確認ができません
。このため、B2C 一時事業者は、店舗販売する商品とは別に、保管する専用倉庫を作って、特別の管理を行ったり、配送時のパッケージの破損等による衛生状態の問題を回避するために、強度の高い包装資材や緩衝材を使ったりと、B2CEC を通じた食品の安全確保が図られるような工夫をしています。それでは、事前にいただいていた質問に対してお答えをいたします。一つ目の質問に対しては、日本において届け出制度を導入したことにより、国内の B2C、EC 事業者の実態把握が可能となりました。このため、安全にかかる問題が発生した場合には、実態を踏まえた迅速な対処ができるようになっています。2つ目の質問になりますけれども、EC 事業者を含む食品関係事業者は、原則、事業者の従業員の中から食品衛生に主体となって取り組む食品衛生責任者を設置をしなければなりません。で、この食品衛生責任者には、ハサフを含む食品衛生にかかる教育が行われますが、まあ、本年6月から始まった取り組みでもあり、まあ、この効果判断については、まあ、今後の課題というふうに今考えています。また、あの、改正法に関する説明動画を、厚生労働省ホームページに掲載し、まあ、消費者をはじめ、事業者などが幅広く学べるようにしています。最後に3つ目の質問になりますけれども、ISO2 万2000、FSSC といった第三者認証は、食品安全確保や円滑な小取引に有効であるというふうに考えていますが、一方で、小規模な事業者がこれを取得するには大きな負担となるというふうに考えます。このため、日本においては、事業者が任意に取り組んで、第三者認証を取得しているという状況です。以上、日本における EC を通じて流通する食品についての安全確保の取り組み状況をご紹介をいたしました。今後も日本における EC を通じた食品流通は、ますます拡大するというふうに思っておりますので、引き続き必要な対応を取っていきたいというふうに考えています。ご清聴どうもありがとうございました。In Brazil. Welcome, Mr. Rocha. Over to you. Olá, todos. Inicialmente, gostaria de deixar o agradecimento ao FDA pelo convite, pela oportunidade de poder discutir e apresentar os desafios relacionados ao e-commerce de alimentos em meu país, no Brasil. É, já fui apresentado, meu nome é Fábio Miranda Rocha, sou o inspetor de saúde pública da Agência Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária, Anvisa. Bem, o que é essa Agência Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária no Brasil? A agência foi criada é, em 1999, através desta Lei 972 de 99, basicamente sendo uma autarquia com independência financeira e administrativa, mas ligada ao Ministério da Saúde. O papel da agência reguladora, deixo aqui registrado o um slide para, para todos, mas é, de forma simples, a agência é responsável pela normatização e execução do controle sanitário no ambiente de âmbito federal no Brasil. É, controlando os produtos sujeitos à vigilância sanitária, como alimentos, cosméticos, medicamentos, e assim também como serviços, como serviços hospitalares, é, área de portos, aeroportos e fronteiras, onde a Anvisa é a autoridade sanitária responsável em pontos de entrada no Brasil. E um papel muito importante da agência é de ser a coordenadora do Sistema Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária. O que quer dizer isso? A Anvisa ela não executa é, nada diretamente do mesmo volume que os estados e municípios executam. Os estados e municípios têm uma atuação na vigilância sanitária em loco, muito maior até do que a Anvisa. E a Anvisa atua como um órgão 
coordenador desse processo, não há uma hierarquia entre os três entes, federais, estaduais e municipais, mas sim uma cooperação e uma, uma discussão, uma interligação de ações contínuas. E com isso, dentro do Sistema Único de Saúde, que é o Sistema Público do Brasil, que é um sistema gratuito e universal, a, o Sistema Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária executa as ações de proteção à saúde pública é, no Brasil. Bem, eu não vou entrar em detalhes da, do nossa, da nossa organização de estrutura da vida, mas ah, é só para dar uma ideia do que é esta agência. É, nós temos na agência um corpo, uma diretoria colegiada, que é o nosso corpo diretor, que são cinco, sempre indicados, nomeados, aprovados pelo Congresso Nacional. E ligado às diretorias estão as áreas técnicas ah, da agência. A agência está separada por áreas técnicas, não por produtos, e sim por processos. Portanto, a área de alimentos recebe, tem atuação em diversas diretorias, em diversos departamentos. Eu vou destacar alguns, algumas áreas importantes e cruciais aqui para, para todos dentro da Anvisa. Primeiro, a área de assessoria em relações internacionais. É uma área que é, obviamente, necessária para qualquer contato institucional com a Anvisa no âmbito internacional. Depois, falando mais diretamente sobre o assunto alimentos no Brasil, nós temos a Gerência Geral de Alimentos, que é a gerência responsável por normatizar, por realizar as análises de segurança dos ingredientes que vão ser utilizados em alimentos no Brasil, fazer os processos de anuência dos registros dos alimentos que ainda são exigidos em alguns casos no Brasil. E passando depois para a área a qual eu pertenço, que é a Gerência Geral de Fiscalização e Inspeção de Alimentos, que está em outra diretoria, mas atua basicamente cumprindo ou fiscalizando o cumprimento das normas exaradas pela Anvisa. E a, a, outro destaque do, do, da organização vai para o Porto de Aeroportos e Fronteiras. Essa gerência geral é responsável pela importação e exportação de todos os produtos é, relacionados sujeitos à vigilância sanitária, inclusive os alimentos. Voltando agora mais ao foco da apresentação, poder falar um pouco mais da realidade da Anvisa em relação ao e-commerce no Brasil, os problemas, as irregularidades, as ocorrências sanitárias mais, mais comuns no Brasil. É bom que se diga que aqui eu falo com fotografia do ambiente federal, não dos estados e municípios, que podem ter realidades diferentes, como eu falei anteriormente, mas é uma fotografia do que a Anvisa atua e recebe com mais frequência. Primeiro, o que é mais comum são as denúncias e apurações relacionadas a alegações terapêuticas feitas para propaganda de alimentos. Isso não é permitido, muitas vezes inclusive alegações graves como é, tratamento ou prevenção de doenças como câncer, é, doenças cardiovasculares, diabetes, etc. Isso é a maior demanda hoje que, que a Anvisa atua é, nesse setor de e-commerce. Seguido pelas outras três é, etapas da pirâmide, estão todos relacionados a um produto como pode ser visto bastante complicado no Brasil, que são os suplementos alimentares, em diferentes escalas. Primeira é, são os suplementos alimentares que são comercializados, ou tentam se comercializar, com ingredientes alimentícios é, que não são aprovados para esta categoria de alimentos. O que quer dizer isso? A Anvisa ela exige... Ela tem uma lista, de, uma lista positiva de ingredientes que podem ser utilizados em suplementos. Essa lista é baseada em evidências científicas daqueles é, ingredientes que fornecem ou nutrientes, ou substâncias bioativas, ou enzimas, ou probióticos. E às vezes, as, as companhias, as empresas resolvem é, inserir outros ingredientes que não têm nenhuma função e por isso não é permitido que seja comercializado desta forma. Após isso, é, tem os produtos de, da medicina tradicional chinesa, que na realidade não são suplementos alimentares da categoria no Brasil, mas estão aqui tentados ser, serem comercializados como suplementos alimentares. Eles são, na realidade, medicamentos classificados aqui no Brasil. Portanto, é outra forma de tentar escapar um pouco da legislação é, é, de medicamentos que é mais rígida. E o, o último, o topo, que é em menor frequência, mas é grave, é a vinculação e a comercialização de suplementos alimentares com substâncias proibidas, dopantes, anabolizantes é, e assim por diante. Como que a Anvisa trabalha uh, nessa atuação no e-commerce de alimentos? Basicamente, nós temos uma atuação de rotina baseada em duas, dois pontos iniciais, ou através de denúncias ou 
uma vigilância ativa que os inspetores realizam na internet. E após a identificação ou recebimento da denúncia, essas, essas informações são direcionadas a uma área chamada área de triagem, uma área de screening, onde é, tem uma equipe especializada que consegue ali já ter um diagnóstico se há uma materialidade de infração sanitária e uma suposta autoria que seja possível de ser alcançada dentro do trâmite é, da Anvisa. Esta área pode definir, de acordo com essa avaliação inicial, o caminho dessa denúncia, o caminho dessa vigilância dentro da agência. Pode ser aberta uma investigação dentro do âmbito federal, dentro da Anvisa, e esse caso geralmente são produtos de maior risco sanitário que é uma distribuição nacional ou até internacional. Por isso, a agência federal entra é, com a investigação na própria agência. Ou a, essa equipe de screening pode direcionar essa, essas informações para as vigilâncias dos estados e municípios que vão atuar diretamente. Isso nos casos dos produtos é, de menor risco ou com distribuição local, regional, que não faz sentido uma intervenção federal. No caso da investigação da Anvisa, após a investigação comprovar a materialidade das infrações e qualificar os autores dessas infrações, a Anvisa ela exara medidas restritivas, que podem ser a proibição de uso, de propaganda, de comercialização, até mesmo, nos casos mais graves, o recolhimento desses elementos do mercado. E essa publicação das medidas restritivas é feita no Diário Oficial da União, onde, ou seja, o um jornal oficial do governo brasileiro, e também estão disponíveis os links que eu deixo aqui, que este é um link dos, das consultas para as medidas exaradas pela Anvisa. E também, no caso de alimentos, a Anvisa tem uma rede de cooperação com representantes de todos os, os estados, chamada Reale, e recebe automaticamente os alertas gerados quando são, são publicadas alguma medida restritiva pela Anvisa em alimentos. Esse segundo tópico eu deixo registrado, importante aqui, porque a atuação de todos os inspetores da Anvisa na Gerência Geral de Fiscalização e Inspeção ela é baseada num programa no sistema de, de qualidade, baseado na, na ISO 9001-2015, não só, também outros programas e outros casos relacionados a farmacêuticos, principalmente. Qual é o intuito desse padrão? É que tenha, desde a da chegada da denúncia ou da vigilância ativa, está tudo padronizado conforme as evidências científicas que nós temos em todos os setores, para que tenhamos uma, uma medida, mesmo que sejam diferentes inspetores, medidas muito próximas, muito harmônicas, mais harmônicas possíveis. E assim, ter uma maior isonomia é, do nossa, das nossas decisões. E outro aspecto importante para lidar com os problemas de e-commerce é, no Brasil é uma cooperação contínua com outras instituições como o direito do consumidor, as autoridades de, judiciais, nos casos que são necessários, por exemplo, acessar dados pessoais de pessoas e mídias sociais e que façam propaganda ou que façam a venda de alguns produtos irregulares. Outra forma de atuação importante que a Anvisa vem adotando nos últimos tempos em relação ao e-commerce é através de treinamentos, oficinas e outros eventos direcionados tanto a, a agências locais e estaduais, quanto a própria indústria, quanto as plataformas de, de venda eletrônica, de forma que possa trocar experiências e possa evoluir assim as formas de regulação existentes. E nos últimos dois anos, como passamos por esse processo da, da pandemia do Covid-19, a Anvisa ampliou bastante os webinars uh, no Brasil, ou seja, são as conferências virtuais, e onde são apresentados é, diversos temas na Anvisa. A Anvisa tem diversas apresentações disponíveis, eu até deixei aqui o link já com as, alguns dos webinars realizados, e faço destaque para um que foi já realizado em agosto deste ano, pela área de medicamentos, voltado especificamente para as plataformas eletrônicas é, de venda no Brasil, onde tivemos a participação de 50, aproximadamente, representantes das principais plataformas de venda no Brasil, e a eficácia desse treinamento ainda está sob avaliação da área responsável, então, infelizmente, eu não tenho os resultados ainda para trazer, mas foi um evento bastante produtivo. A outra forma que é sempre interessante de se regular o mercado é com transparência. Esse é um dos valores da Anvisa, e com isso também eu deixo aqui registrado a todos na apresentação um link da página da Anvisa, onde é possível encontrar todo o arcabouço legal, todas as normas, todos os guias, todos os documentos de perguntas e respostas, documentos técnicos que a Anvisa produz em relação à área de alimentos 
Então, todos podem ser comprados aí por qualquer cidadão, qualquer indústria, qualquer empresa, qualquer ambiente eletrônico também. E, por último, nessa etapa, é essa, essa educação social através das novas, né, não tão novas, mas as novas mídias sociais que estão tão em moda e a Anvisa não tem se furtado a interagir e postar mais na sua mídia social oficial, nas suas mídias oficiais, é, temas pertinentes a esse e-commerce. Poucos aspectos dos impactos da, do ambiente internacional regulatório com a vigilância do e-commerce no Brasil. É importante dizer que uh, ainda não, entendemos que não há um, um padrão internacional é, consolidado no tema. É, e isso é muito importante no, do, 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 no aspecto para a Anvisa, porque com certeza fortalece essa relação com outros países, que os produtos transitam de um país com muita facilidade, de um país para outro com muita facilidade. E um, um documento interessante, que eu deixo aqui também registrado, inclusive com o link, é da, do Codex Alimentários, é um rascunho de rotulagem de alimentos no e-commerce, que está sendo trabalhado no ambiente do Codex Alimentários, pode ser um ponto de partida interessante para todos, por isso fiz questão de deixar aqui. O segundo ponto é a ausência de, um, de canais de comunicação mais ágeis entre as autoridades internacionais, que hoje os trâmites, muitas vezes, não têm a mesma velocidade que a internet é capaz de produzir. Então, à medida que gera um alerta de, por exemplo, um produto sendo enviado é, de um país é, como os Estados Unidos para o Brasil, hoje não temos agilidade de poder entrar em contato diretamente com as autoridades americanas e solicitar também um apoio de cooperação, informando que está havendo uma venda de um produto irregular, um produto até é, falseado, ou que seja, para o Brasil para que possa ter uma ação condenada, porque à medida que se solta uma publicação de uma medida restritiva, essa empresa tira do, dos Estados Unidos e volta para outro país e consegue assim fugir é, do, de ações mais eficazes. Isso é um problema, e um problema, imagino que seja um problema mundial. E um, por último, também um pouco nesse sentido, a simetria de regras sanitárias, de controles sanitários é, em outros países, dificulta é, todo o trabalho de e-commerce, acredito que no mundo inteiro, principalmente, por exemplo, hoje nos serviços postais de correios, onde qualquer é, empresa ou cidadão consegue enviar um, um medicamento, muitas vezes, obviamente fingindo que é um alimento, é, para um usuário do Brasil e em poucos dias ele recebe isso em sua casa. E dificilmente o sistema de fiscalização consegue é, cobrir ou restringir 100% desse, desse comércio pelo volume que hoje é bem grande. Bem, era isso, um breve resumo. Então, me ater ao tempo que eu havia disponibilidade, deixo aqui de novo o meu agradecimento. Também todos os contatos da, da, da agência, todas as mídias sociais e, e o website para contatos futuros. Muito obrigado e bom dia, boa tarde a todos. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Our next speaker is Ms. Julie Pierce. She is the Director of Openness, Data, and Digital, Director for Wales, and Director of Science, Evidence, and Research, all with the Food Standards Agency in the United Kingdom. Ms. Pierce, welcome and over to you. Hello, I'm Julie Pierce. I'm the Director Responsible for Science, Information, and Wales at the Food Standards Agency in the UK. Now, we recognize the increase in e-commerce for food a few years back. And first of all, we started to see the food aggregators, Just Eat, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, new but similar to each other. We then saw the rest. Many more were appearing from big to small. So we could see we were looking at something different. But really, were they food businesses just wrapped in a digital coat or something else? Were they more or less risky? Did our existing controls apply? And how should we respond? And then, could we even see these digital businesses operating? Then the pandemic hit, and the whole thing became bigger, changing faster as businesses themselves pivoted from physical to online, as people left the jobs they could no longer do and came into a sector that was apparently easy to enter. So we commissioned some research to understand the market and how it was evolving. 
We wanted a taxonomy to understand the shape and nature of these businesses. They weren't all the same, but were they built from the same building blocks? What is common to all of them? Fundamentally, food is being bought and sold and supplied to the consumer. So what is different? And I think for me, seeing the platforms was key. And they were starting to stand out as being different. There were many small micro businesses and also there were the big traditional physical retailers. And they were starting to move in to have an online channel. But these big digital platforms were different. And then are these digital platforms themselves all the same or no? And we begin to see again those that are focusing on food delivery, but also the big marketplaces that are selling food but have a much, much wider offer. So what is the impact on the food ecosystem? What have been the shared characteristics or themes that we're drawing out? We're seeing tech businesses entering the food world, native tech companies that don't know or don't want to know about food or food safety. We're seeing the supply chains being rearranged. There's no reason to keep the existing supply chains if they're not working for them. It's easy to switch. We're seeing online as default businesses, businesses that really only optimally operate as online. We're seeing lots of information on the supply chain, lots of data about the business themselves, but also the whole of their supply chains. We see increased interconnectedness of the businesses and the ecosystem they generate around themselves. Seeing ever adapting business models, just because they can, they will change. They'll extend out and start to operate in new areas really quickly. And just as quickly, they might pull back if it's not working for them and they're not making money. We've seen bundling and unbundling of business process steps. The classic shape of the businesses are changing and changing repeatedly. We're seeing the faster emergence of new businesses and the change of those businesses. And sometimes the demise of them as well, just as quickly. We see decreased visibility of business identity often. That unbundling might include unbundling of the ownership of the business from its brand. Or maybe the creation of dark kitchens where it's just really not clear at all who owns or operates that dark kitchen. And then finally, seeing private standard setting. So many of the businesses do have standards. They create them. They may be their standards of their own making or they're using ours. We think is great. So overall, as we sit back and look at what we've learned, what is the real risk? And I think we can say it's not as great as maybe we feared when we went into this. Whilst there's a large number of businesses, many of them are very small. And so the scale of the risk is low. And most actually do want to do the right thing. They just want to find an easy way to learn and to do it quickly. And the big platforms themselves often will help to get the smaller businesses to do the right thing through the application of their own controls or the provision of information and support to the business that they've listed. They want them to succeed. So we're not done, not done at all. We continue to add to our understanding as to what is happening in this fast evolving sector. But we haven't created new regulation or legislation. We're using what we already have. But we're getting more confident in understanding and seeing the businesses as they're operating. And the big challenge that we face, as I said, is with the digital platforms. Those platforms that assert they are not food businesses taking no responsibility for the safety of the food being sold by the other businesses that use them. So maybe in a little more detail, what are we doing? We're trying to be where these digital businesses are, seeing the world through their lens, understanding how they operate um, and how we can get them to operate to our standards. We first try to get them to do the right thing 
So maybe for themselves, monitoring what they've got going through their platform, whether it's food products or businesses they're listing, and quickly removing the unsafe and risky food and tracing it back to root cause. And they can do that quickly. They've got the data to be able to do that fast. Or maybe we want them to take off those businesses that have got a low food hygiene rating score. So they shouldn't be working at all. They shouldn't be in operation. And often those big platforms will take them out much more quickly than we can. We're giving them relevant, easily consumable guidance for them to use and to share with the businesses they list. It's digital first. We're monitoring the market. We're automatically scanning the main platforms to see businesses that are operating but not registered. And also using image recognition to see businesses that display a food hygiene rating but don't really have one. We're also helping consumers complain to those businesses. Often they feel impenetrable. They're happy to sell to you, but it's really hard to complain when something goes wrong. And that's both for the uh, consumers themselves, but also the local authorities that are enforcement partners. So we're creating standard APIs that will be easy for these big digital platforms to use. So there's no excuse. It'll be easy for all parties to use the same API. Now, we think that we should not do this alone. We see that some of these platforms are super powerful. They're operating in many other sectors beyond food and working, hopefully, with many other regulators and also in other jurisdictions. This isn't just a UK thing. And so we're hoping that all of the regulators that need to regulate these big players need to be aligned to make those changes happen. And that is a challenge. But there is something working for us. There is an emerging safety tech market um, that's been developed for other online harms. And we're looking to see whether we can repurpose that technology and reuse it to see food safety risk. Now, we do see the importance of international alignment of these platforms, um, alignment of the regulation and standards that they should be operating to. There is food being imported using these big platforms as the vehicle. We can see that. And that with other subsectors, we see that alignment as valuable for the regulator, business, and consumer. And we at the FSA also wish to share what we know, what we've learned, and also some of these tools that we've developed that might help all of us along this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Our next speaker is Dr. George Schreiber. He is the head of the Department of Food Safety within the control of food, feed, cosmetics, consumer goods, and tobacco products traded on the internet, all within Germany's Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety. Over to you, Dr. Schreiber. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first, I would like to thank FDA for giving me the opportunity here to uh, present how we do e-commerce control in Germany and what challenges we are facing. In Germany, we have 400 districts and each of them has a competent authority which is responsible for food control. So they are doing the inspection of the food businesses and they are enforcing food law. And they are organized in 16 federal states. We call it in Germany, Länder, 16 Länder. And these the Länder governments, the Länder ministries are actually responsible that in their territory, the food law is enforced. So we have a very federal structure. But in case of e-commerce control, we decided in Germany in 2013 to create one, one central unit, the name is Gezielt, who is doing the internet searches for all of these 400 competent authorities. And they are doing it not only for food, but also for feed, 
for cosmetics, for consumer products, for tobacco. We have meanwhile an, a unit who does uh, searches for pesticides, the control of pesticides. And we are talking also about currently to, um, to uh, control also the trade of pets. Yeah. So we do centralized searches in order to avoid double or multiple work. So, and secondly, by, by organizing all this, all the work in one central unit, we can concentrate the expertise. So these people in this unit, they have special hardware, special software, of course, and uh, they have meanwhile a lot of skills to do internet investigations. Uh, so what are our achievements? In the European Union, and so also in Germany, each food business operator has to be registered with its competent authority. And we are now, we are, since years now, we are enforcing that on the internet. So we are working together uh, with our federal, uh, federal central tax office, which runs 24-7 uh, a web crawler uh, which is looking for e-businesses. And of all these data of, of all business, we can extract, we have the legal base to extract the food businesses, the e-food business, and together with the, federal, with the competent authorities, we are checking whether they are uh, registered or not. We are informing also the big marketplaces, the platforms, Amazon, eBay, Alibaba Group, and so on. If a product is offered on their marketplace, which is a risk to the health of the consumers or which uh, misleads the consumers. So we are informing them and then they be under EU law, they become responsible if they do not act immediately. So they have to remove uh, these uh, products from, from their website. Thirdly, we have in the European Union, we have the request that all the information which is normally on a food package uh, on mandatory uh, way, so it's mandatory to put this information on a food package, this information has to be put also on the website where the product is offered. And so the, the, the consumer can have access to this information before the purchase is made. Uh, we have also under EU law, we have uh, the possibility to close websites. Of course, this is only the last measure. So we use them, we use this measure, this power, if traders are not responding, not responding. So if they are in a third country, for example, if they are outside of the EU and they are not responding to our requests, then we can close their websites if they offer unlawful products. And we have also the power to uh, sample online without identifying our, as, uh, us as a control authority. So we can, uh, we can uh, buy products and use them as official samples. And uh, we can do that not only for all the food chain products, but also for consumer products. This is, of course, a very important um, uh, achievement. So, but uh, beside all these achievements, which we made during the past years, we've still faced a lot of challenges. And um, so we are quite happy that the European Commission has put forward a proposal for a new law, the Digital Service Act, which, uh, which gives much more responsibility to the marketplaces in order to, to make them offer lawful products uh, on their marketplaces and remove the unlawful products. And in these discussions, we are requesting from, from the food side that these marketplaces are checking whether the e-food business uh, operators, which are, which are on their platforms offering products, whether these are registered. So this should be the task of the platforms. And it should be also the task of the platforms to inform the public if an, 
uh, if a non-compliant uh, product has been offered, so non-compliant with our legal requirements. Secondly, very important, we request the cooperation of the payment service providers and the logistic companies because um, some of these companies are cooperating with us and some not. So on logistic companies, uh, if we are doing online uh, purchases, then we need not only um, a neutral credit card, we don't need only a neutral email address, we need also a neutral delivery address in order to not be identified as control authorities. And some are cooperating, some not, so we, we request uh, uh, a legal basis to make them cooperating. The same is true for payment service providers. We have, from time to time, we have traders who are hiding, who are offering by purpose unlawful products. Sometimes they are in third countries, sometimes in the EU, sometimes in, the, in, in Germany, of course. And uh, of course, our unit has uh, the means to, to find them, but not in all cases. And in these cases, we need the cooperation of the payment service providers to give us the correct address uh, of these traders in order to, to, uh, to put measures on them. And finally, what we are requesting is a uh, legal basis to, to search in general on the internet without being identified as a control authority. So not only buying products uh, anonymously, but also doing in general searches. And this is particularly important for social media. So um, what do we do with the consumers? Of course, we inform the consumers how to shop safely on the internet. Yeah, we have on our websites, we have a little shop, uh, kind of shop where, where, they, where we, we make them aware, where are the challenges, where are the points where they should be particularly careful. And we have also put this information on paper and we do annual reports and we of course try to distribute it at any occasion where we meet, uh, meet uh, consumers. In the same way, we are informing the traders we have put in simple language the main requirements and the main obligations of traders. We, we uh, distribute this information via our website, of course, but also we send it to the trade association and we have given it to the marketplaces in order to, to give them the possibility to put, to put this information on their website. In the European Union. The European Commission has uh, a unit which quite a number of inspectors who are checking the EU member states, whether the competent authorities of the EU member states, whether they are able to transpose and enforce uh, the EU food law. And um, so member states are constantly checked this is a standard process since many decades, but now the European, Com European Commission has also started um, to, to do this on e-commerce controls. They started with, in 2017 with, e with fact-finding fact missions and now they announced audits and they will check how the EU member states do the control on the internet. And finally, I would like to mention Codex. Codex has also started to put this subject on their agenda and uh, we, are, we are appreciating that very much and we are uh, contributing there on the Codex level actively. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, the, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber, and thank you to all of our panel members. It was intriguing to hear all, how all of you are addressing business to consumer food safety oversight in your own countries. So let's start the panel session. I'm going to pose two additional questions to each of you today. Here's the first question. 
What regulatory and compliance challenges exist with respect to your current regulatory structure for business-to-consumer e-commerce businesses that sell human food? And in addition, what regulatory approaches have been effective? I'm going to start off with Dr. Mickey. Over to you first. はいえー、と国内の B2CEC 事業者の、まあ、実態把握がまあ困難というふうなまあ課題がありましたけれども、あと届け出制度を導入したことにより、まあ、国内の B2CEC 事業者のまあ実態把握がまあ可能というふうになって、えー、なりました。また、リコールを行う際に、えー、届け出を義務化したということによって、まあ、消費者やまあ流通事業者に対して、まあ、リコール情報がまあ迅速に提供できるようになったと。Thank you, Dr. Mickey. Let's go to Mr. Rocha. Obrigado pela pela pergunta. Na realidade, são muitos desafios hoje regulatórios e contratos para comércio no Brasil. O primeiro que eu destacaria é pelas ações do Brasil serem descentralizadas, que funcionam muito bem, mas no caso do e-commerce, acaba que a articulação. com as agências estaduais e municipais, é, acaba ampliando a dificuldade de conseguir atingir, por exemplo, para poder fazer as fiscalizações, as inspeções nas, nas companhias como as cozinhas fantasmas, as lojas escuras, ou seja, aqueles, aqueles mercados e aquelas, aquelas indústrias ou lojas que não estão hoje, digamos, é, formalmente... instaladas junto à vigilância sanitária do município ou do estado que necessitam ser autorizadas e muitas vezes no caso do e-commerce eles não estão regularizados da forma convencional e isso particular com as agências locais é bastante difícil no Brasil até pelo tamanho e pela diferença que tem de culturas e capacidades instaladas nos municípios e estados brasileiros. Outra questão que é bastante impactante no Brasil é a, o marco civil da internet aqui, que é chamado aqui a Lei 2.965 de 2014, que é a lei que, que estabelece as regras para o uso da internet no Brasil, ou seja, a proteção da privacidade, da, dos dados pessoais, a inviabilidade da, da vida privada, etc. As ações de saúde pública que a Visa realiza elas não estão na esfera privada, mas algumas vezes... É, nós é, precisamos, necessitamos acionar os sistemas judiciais para poder é, qualificar os, os infratores, principalmente quando eles estão localizados dentro de mídias sociais, porque eles são protegidos, é, com, é um benefício a todos, claro, mas por esse, por esse marco civil da internet no Brasil, e realmente só com uma decisão é, de um tribunal, que é possível obter esses dados junto aos servidores e às plataformas, e etc. Então, isso é um desafio, muitas vezes, porque é, demora um tempo para você conseguir, às vezes, esse contato e esse trâmite no sistema judiciário brasileiro. A dificuldade também bem grande no Brasil é de obter, quando, quando se obtém esses dados, muitas vezes, de cadastro, por exemplo, é, de uma plataforma ou de mídias sociais, Muitas informações são limitadas para poder conseguir alcançar esse fator ou é, até mesmo são falseadas, porque muitas das plataformas das, das mídias não têm nenhum controle, nenhum cheque é, dessas informações. E aí esse comerciante acaba migrando para um ambiente, por exemplo, em outros países. Né? Pode botar isso em um ponto com, em um ponto AU, em outros países, e assim ele consegue manter seu mercado ativo. E, e sempre com informações nem sempre verdadeiras se é possível de alcançar pela autoridade sanitária. Acho que esses seriam os três principais é, desafios no Brasil. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. I'm going to tag Ms. Pierce next. Over to you. So the main uh, challenges that we're facing in the UK um, relate to those businesses. that do not see themselves as food businesses. They say they're not selling food, um, they are simply platforms, um, and they have no responsibility whatsoever for the businesses that are, they list um, or they, they work with. Now, 
that that is a I think a difficult a difficult area um, and so at the moment we're trying to make the most from the um, the regulation and the legislation we already have um, and to date that has um, proven its worth I think we're also very um, open to the other um, regulation and policy um, levers or tools that we've got in the toolbox. Um, so working with businesses, persuading them to do the right thing, um, maybe um, calling out publicly um, where we think their behavior is inappropriate. Um, they really do not want to lose customers. They really do not not want to get a bad name in the marketplace with those people they're selling to. So I, I think we're also mindful of of the power that we we've, we've got in um, the the influencing approach rather than um, pure um, regulation. And then. If we did step into that um, wider um, legislative arena, it takes a long time to um, make make changes there. And we are very mindful in the, U the UK that we probably need to work with other regulators. At the moment in the UK, we have a bill going um, through Parliament about online harms that doesn't address food safety as being one of those those harms. Um, but maybe we can use that to get biz businesses to change their behavior um, and maybe apply a similar sort of approach to food safety in the same way they do other types of online harm. Now, I don't think I'm being overly optimistic in, in that because, again, these businesses, what do they want? They want a level playing field, um, and if they've got to do something, they want to do it only once. Um, so if there are these online harms over here and they're obliged to do something and respond, we say, oh, well, it's relatively easy to apply the same sort of approach to food safety. So that's the sort of approach we're taking. And again, that's why we're looking at um, some of the food um, safety tech that's being developed to, again, say it's being used over here. Um, you understand how it, how it works, what it can do. So maybe we just extend it and apply it over here. So that's the sort of approach that we're taking. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Let's go to Dr. Schreiber. Over to you for final words on question one. So for us in the European Union, and of course in Germany, uh, it is very important that the e-businesses comply with the whole law, with the whole food law, uh, which we have on the EU basis and on the national basis. And um, this is irrespective whether they are trading within the EU or whether they are situated in a third country and uh, then supplying their products to EU, to German consumers. So even if they are in China or in US, they have to comply with EU and national law if they want to put their products on the, on the German market if they want to, to, to supply the uh, German cons consumers with their products. This is very important for us. And this is actually the case also for the stationary uh, trade. So what we are demanding is the same requirements for whether, uh, the same requirements for online uh, businesses as well as offline businesses. So we don't want a discrimination or we don't want advantages for one side or the other side. We would like to have the same requirements for all the businesses, whether they are offline, whether they are online, whether they are in the EU, whether they are outside of the EU, that should be the same. And this is, this is very important for us. And in order to achieve that, of course, we need a uh, strong e-commerce control. So um, we requested the legal basis to, to, uh, to sample online for official sampling. So we, and we, uh, finally, we got the legal basis. We can buy products on the internet and uh, without identifying us, us as a control authority, and we can treat these 
products as uh, these, uh, these products as samples as official samples this was very important for us and um, but we are still facing a lot of challenges so on the marketplaces we we have uh, of course a lot of products which are do not comply with the with the uh, with the law and uh, of course we are we are checking but we cannot check the whole internet so what we are requesting is that the marketplaces uh, take much more responsibility so if they see that a product is is not compliant with legislation they shouldn't put it on on the marketplaces and and with new, with new law we make them we will make them much more responsible as it is today the same uh, as, as uh, the same is true for payment service providers um, so or in in general in the internet service providers what we are seeing is that some quite a lot of internet service providers are cooperating with competent authorities because it, they want to make money they don't want to to have problems with with, uh, with control authorities and enforcement authorities but some do not and for for in order to make them all cooperating with us we need a legal basis and we are working on that in the European Union and I'm very sure that we will achieve that uh, quite, quite shortly. Thank you. Thank you panelists for your responses to my first question. With this area of food purchasing being relatively new, we all have much to learn, don't we? Let's move on to question number two and here it is. What administrative, regulatory, and compliance challenges exist with respect to businesses that sell animal food or pet food through business-to-consumer e-commerce as compared to being sold business-to-business -business or in traditional retail settings? For question number two, I'm going to mix it up a bit and go in reverse order. Dr. Schreiber, you're up. For us, um, again, it's the same like on food. We are requesting that internet feed businesses are respecting uh, the, the EU laws, the national law. So, so they have to respect it in the same way as stationary businesses are doing. And um, there is uh, the challenges is mostly on pets food because uh, the business to business uh, uh, trade uh, this is these are large quantities and they are i mean uh, you you uh, this is normal business but but more and more feed for pets are uh, of course offered on the on the internet and so our our focus lies on on this products and of course we again like 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 with food we are checking whether they are complying with the feed legislation and um, yeah again uh, we we don't want uh, that uh, the e feed businesses have an advantage over the stationary business. They all have to respect the full spectrum of of uh, legal requirements. And in order to enforce that, we have special programs in Germany where we um, where we check uh, special special food uh, for for all these pets. So this is an ongoing process and uh, we have annual programs where we focus on certain products and we are checking them, we are buying these products on the internet, we are checking them in the laboratories and then we, we of course enforce in this way feed law also in the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Let's go to Ms. Julie Pierce. All you. Well, we in the FSA are responsible for what we would call um, feed, animal feed. Um, this isn't an area we've explored. We've prioritized um, food, human food. 
um, and seen that as being the um, the biggest growth area. Um, now, that therefore means that we haven't been particularly looking into this area, so um, I'm not aware of there being any um, particular um, growth um, or even significant risks. Um, I, in saying that, um, we probably need to do more work to understand it, um, and I would also hope that many of the monitoring and um, technology tools we've developed um, for the other types of digital platform and human food, I see no reason why it shouldn't be applied equally to feed. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Mr. Rocha, you're up next. É, a Anvisa não, é, não tem, obrigado pela pergunta, mas a Anvisa não tem atuação é, em toda a cadeia de, de alimentos de origem animal. É, e nem atuação direta atualmente em relação à venda de produtos é, de origem animal no mercado. As vigilâncias estaduais e locais elas têm sim atuação nos açougues ou nos mercados direta com esse produto final. E em relação ao e-commerce, ainda é bastante baixa essa venda de internet no Brasil. Mas quem tem uma atuação mais direta em toda a cadeia é o Ministério da Agricultura, Pecuária e Abastecimento aqui no Brasil, que deve ter mais informações com certeza desse tipo de e-commerce é, no nosso país. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. And lastly, Dr. Mickey. Over to you for last words on this question. はい、えー、動物、まあ、ペット向けの食品についてということでありますけれども、まあ、日本ではあの農林水産省と、まあ、環境省がペ,ペ,ペットフードの安全性の確保に関する、まあ、法律、まあ、いわゆるあのペットフード安全法を、まあ、所管をしていますで、まあ、食品の、まあ、規制とは、まあ、異なるような形になっていますでペットフード安全法ではペットフードの、まあ、成分規格や生存、製造基準といったものを定めており、これに合わないペットフードの製造、販売が禁止をされています。Thank you, Dr. Mickey, for closing out question number two. I appreciate the time our panel members took to participate and share their knowledge with us today. This concludes our panel session. If this panel session spurred an idea or a comment, I encourage anyone in the audience to submit a comment to the docket or to the FDA website associated with our new era for Smarter Food Safety Summit. Again, thank you to my esteemed regulatory panel members that joined me from Japan, Brazil, the UK, Germany, and Canada. Hearing your experiences and perspectives about business to consumer e-commerce is incredibly useful as we move forward in this dialogue about new business models and retail modernization. All of us at the FDA really appreciate your participation today. At this point in the agenda, we have a short break. My colleague, Carrie Barrett, will return to reopen the meeting for open public comments when the break is over. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to all our international regulatory panelists. We're now going to take a 15-minute break, and when we return, I will hand it off to my colleague, Carrie Barrett, who will guide us through the open public comment portion of the agenda.
Well, welcome back, everyone, to the new era of Smarter Food Safety Summit on e-commerce, ensuring the safety of foods ordered online and delivered directly to consumers. We are now at a part of our agenda where we're going to take open public comments. Just hi, hi again. This is Carrie Barrett, a co-moderator. And just as we have over the last two days, we are now transitioning to the public comment session, where we do have a uh, panel of government agency subject matter experts who will listen to prepared stakeholder remarks that are offered during this time. So I want to welcome today's public commenter, comment presenters. We have a group here uh, with a number of international perspectives, so we're very excited to hear all of our speakers today and to bring that aspect into the public comment process. Um, as we've noted the other days, all of our commenters will have five minutes to present their remarks. And before we get started, just as we have, we do want to introduce our panel of FDA experts who will be listening to these public comments. And so, Sharon, Lyndon Mayo, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Carrie. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here again. I am Sharon Lyndon Mayo. I'm Senior Advisor for Policy in the Office of Food Policy and Response, which is in the Office of the Commissioner. And in this position, I manage cross-cutting policy initiatives and currently serve as the lead for the implementation of the new era of Smarter Food Safety Blueprint. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. And Glenda Lewis, we'll go to you. Hello, everyone. It's also my pleasure to be with you today. I'm the director for the Retail Food Protection staff within the Office of Food Safety and FDA Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And I'm responsible for oversight of the teams that develop national policy for retail food safety and also policy for the interstate travel program in regards to interstate travel conveyances. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Glenda. And Mary Cartagena? Hi, my name is Mary Cartagena, and I work for the Retail Food Policy Team within the Office of Food Safety Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And I lead the team in development of retail policy documents, such as the FDA Food Code, the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program, as, as, along with other retail policy documents and I look forward to hearing the comments today. Great. Thank you, Mary. And next we'll go to Lori Farmer. Lori, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Lori Farmer, the Director of the Office of State Cooperative Programs. My responsibility in FDA is around field program strategic direction in retail food protection, molluscan shellfish, sanitation, and grade A milk safety. Looking forward to the comment today. Great, thank you. And I want to welcome a new uh, subject matter expert to our panel today, and that is Susan Burns. Susan? Thanks, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here and join this panel. My name is Susan Barrett. I'm the Deputy Director for International Affairs Staff at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at FDA. I support the Center's mission to protect and promote public health by providing leadership and guidance on international activities and initiatives across the span. Great. Well, thank you all, and thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from our uh, public commenters. So at this time, the FDA group, we are going to turn our cameras off, and I will call up each commenter, and again, there will be five minutes. And our first commenter is John Spink, Michigan State University Food Fraud Prevention Academy. And John, thank you for joining us again this afternoon. Thank you. First, the, these comments are my own and not of my institution or of anyone else. Thank you for the opportunity to comment here today, and I commend FDA for taking this step to first ask a lot of questions. Everything I've prepared here supports the comments of the other presenters. I'm Dr. John Spink. I'm director of the Food Fraud Prevention Academy. I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Supply Chain Management within the Michigan State University Business College. And my, my supply chain management role includes overseeing the content and instruction of our Introduction to Supply Chain course. And that supply chain management scope includes the type of foundation setting that you're addressing in this meeting. 
My food fraud prevention and supply chain management roles are especially applicable to this meeting since you are first looking for system weaknesses that builds upon my product fraud research and research of others. You're starting with a food supply chain mapping to look at the big picture, and then you're conducting risk assessments to identify the problem areas before considering any regulatory gaps. Your meeting can create a foundation for all of us to build upon, and the foundation can identify the areas of concern and the most efficient role for each food safety chain partner. The FDA is taking a proactive first step aligned with standards such as ISO 31000 risk management, and that's establishing the context, and following ISO 9000 quality management and ISO 22000 food safety management. The next step is to gather incident information to conduct risk identification before considering the risk assessment models that you would use or even assessing those models. Those key steps include supply chain mapping to identify how product flows and who handles the products. This provides the information to conduct a criminology type hotspot analysis to look for those problem areas. These are important steps to prepare for conducting that actual risk assessment. And by taking these steps, we can usually break complex systems into many pretty simple maps. After seeing the meeting announcement, we mentioned the meeting in, in blog posts, and one thing led to another, and we just published our sixth, sixth follow-up report. You can find these on our website or posted on LinkedIn, and we will we'll also submit these in the written comments. We went through a lot of the different concepts and background and basics, and the most recent document includes a list of terms and definitions such as ghost kitchen and dark stores. It was interesting to start listing the terms and mapping the supply chain, and we kept uncovering different attributes of the overall food supply chain map. We also provided a link to a shared document where stakeholders can comment or edit the glossary itself. Your meeting has created encouragement for this type of foundation setting, and, and good luck, and, and please feel free to contact me or us uh, to know if or how we can help. I can be contacted at foodfraudprevention.com, and with that, I'd say thank you. I guess uh, the end of my presentation. All right. John, thank you so much for your comments, and we'll now go to our next uh, public commenter, which is Amet. Karadia, Amit. Thank you. Yes, thank you and good afternoon. My name is Amitam Karadia, Education and Technical Support Manager for Remco, based in Zionsville, Indiana. We supply high-quality sanitation and material handling tools, such as brushes, brooms, and shovels, to our North American clients in the food manufacturing, retail, and food service sectors. We're now part of Denmark. Uh, headquartered company, Beacon, a leading manufacturer of hygiene cleaning tools with a global presence in over 90 countries. This association has greatly enabled us to offer world-class support to our clients through color coding solutions, hygienically designed tools, hygienic zoning, tool management, 5S, and other best-in-class sanitation recommendations. Our focus in these areas becomes crucial since we estimate about one in three food recalls in North America are directly related with improper hygiene, cleaning, sanitation, and material handling practices within establishments. As industry representatives, we are highly supportive of the FDA's new era of smarter food safety initiatives, such as this retail e-commerce summit. I'd like to state five key issues or points I believe the FDA may need to address in their B2C e-commerce model deliberations that may have been covered in this summit in one form or another. First issue is we need clarity on compliance status of retail e-commerce ordered foods on possibility that delivered products shall pass from one state to another having variable public health regulations. Such variability poses two additional risks. Product might be compliant yet not safe or product might be safe yet not compliant. Whether B2C companies need to comply with federal regulations or public health regulations of the client's location or the latest food code, or whether uniform adoption of food code by states may resolve this issue are some questions to ask. Second point regards closely re-examining risks associated with e-commerce ordered and delivered foods. They cannot be equated with the manufacturing facility because clearly the scenario has changed. We now have a largely uncontrolled, uncharted territory that changes with, say, each online consumer grocery transaction with a different food safety risk portfolio and an assortment of delivery loads that may pose uh, multi-food safety challenges. Here, FDA could provide risk-based food safety plan development guidance to cater for such complexities. Third issue is about establishing virtual and sustainable food safety controls. Technological innovation and consumer expectations 
outpacing regulation is a reality. So controls may get reassessed with every change. Many field regulations are best left at minimum bare bones since the owners should lie more with industry and their partners to design better controls. Moreover, we also need robust controls whose effectiveness should remain unaffected by such market changes. FDA, with the help of stakeholders, can support industry in the development of stronger controls in part by offering non-binding recommendations. Fourth point, employees of working across e-commerce food supply chain need to be motivated through continuous awareness, education, training, and refresher update modules. Hence, communicating with clear, bite-sized, effective training modules, especially for players in this last mile delivery, becomes key. However, considering the varied demography of players, the belonging to third party organizations, and them having different skill sets may create hurdles. Again, here, FDA and stakeholders can help address such barriers to education and training. And finally, fifth issue, how can we encourage customers at the last mile delivery end to provide feedback on food safety issues in the best possible way? Are our online communication systems designed to effectively capture, analyze, and relay actionable information to the supply chain players in the spirit of fostering continuous food safety culture improvement. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. This concludes my remarks. Thank you so much for your remarks today and for joining us. We now will go on to our next uh, speaker, and that is Charmaine Khan. Charmaine? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to give my comments today. Um, so my name is Charmaine Khan. I'm the founder and chief marketing officer of OpSmart Global. We are a food safety and traceability company, and we are also one of the proud winners of the FDA traceability, traceability challenge that ended last month. So we're super excited about that. Um, and so I'm going to comment a little bit from the tech perspective of how we see a business to consumer partnership um, forming in, in the e-commerce space. Um, we believe that it's really important that FDA mandate some sort of a serialization similar to what the pharmaceutical industry has. Um, we feel that it's very important to create a food safety code per se so that when you speak of the segments within the e-commerce food market of meal kit delivery, grocery delivery, prepared food delivery, we feel each of those segments needs to be assigned a code. We feel that every provider, every company within that segment needs to have their own code as well. So when a meal kit is delivered to the doorstep of a consumer, they have a barcode at their hand. So if they open that package and they have an issue with that package for any reason, there should be a code ready for the consumer to scan and let the FDA know that there is a problem with that particular meal kit. And what this does is it removes all sorts of fraud. So when you get a blue apron box at your door, you know it is a blue apron box at your door, not somebody who has chosen to replicate the box. This creates responsibility within the food supply chain, creates responsibility, create, removes fraud, and most importantly, it empowers the consumer and connects them directly to the FDA so that when that um, when the um, homeowner who opens that package scans the barcode, they can connect to the FDA and say, there's something wrong, we need to return this, and at that same time, FDA is immediately informed of a problem with that package, and then they can reach out to the producer of that package and capture the challenge that they're facing on their production line and remove it or stop it at that point. So that returns us back to the conversation of food traceability and recall management, which is intrinsic to the new era of food safety. So it connects both e-commerce and food safety and the new era all together by serialization, by providing responsibility and empowering the consumer at the same time. And we believe FDA has the responsibility to do that um, in order to keep the food system safe. Thank you so much for my comments and I will um, put myself on mute, I assume. 
Okay. Thank you. And thank you for joining us and for offering your thoughts. And uh, we, we deeply appreciate all of our public commenters today for taking the time. We now will go on to our next one, uh, which is Maria Jose Plana Casado. Maria? Good afternoon. Good evening from Amsterdam. Uh, my name is Maria Jose Plana Casado, and I am assistant professor at the Law Group of Wageningen University in the Netherlands where I teach European, U.S., and Chinese food law. At Wageningen, I carry out research on the regulatory challenges of the digitalization of the food system with a team of colleagues leading food and environmental legal research in the European Union. I am intervening here today to ask the FDA, but also other regulators globally, such as that of the European Union, to launch a comprehensive review of current food laws and regulations to make sure that the rules are fit for purpose in online marketplaces, enabling third-party suppliers to trade e-foods. As I examine in my recent book titled E-Food Bridging the Online Enforcement Gap, we need rules that take into account the particularities of online marketplaces. Because online marketplaces challenge long-standing legal arrangements in the US, in the European Union, and abroad. For instance, Marketplaces are not legally responsible for mandatory information. The trader is under consumer law rules and under food law. But their private rules, marketplaces rules, and their interface shaped food information to a great extent. I want to focus my intervention on one main additional concern, supplier volatility in marketplaces and its impact on compliance with legal requirements. I will explain. In marketplaces, consumers have the choice of buying products from not only popular retailers, but also from smaller disruptive businesses, home-based suppliers, or even their peers. This is due to the fact that platforms dilute market access barriers by providing anyone from anywhere with a ready-to-use interface to offer e -books. But peers and micro-businesses are often not aware of their obligations regarding food safety or food not and this generates novel safety and legal risks. And the pop-up nature of offers in marketplaces challenges enforcement actions to remediate non-compliance, because too often, when a problem arises, the supplier is no, uh, no longer active in the platform. Therefore, it is necessary to adopt measures to ensure that consumers know what type of supplier they are buying from. And it is also essential that the new laws assign marketplaces obligations regarding the safety of the offers they facilitate. Taking that into account, I am asking you today that regulators adopt rules ensuring the following. First, that consumers can clearly identify whether a supplier is a traditional retailer, a home-based supplier, or a peer. Some big marketplaces voluntarily do so, but most service providers don't. Second, that there are clear rules determining the legal obligations on home-based suppliers and peer traders operating in platforms, because those are operating in the state commons, no longer protected by cottage food laws. And third, regulators should require that platform design requires, at least, proof of the supplier has been registered as a business in order to use the platform. What's his nickname? What's his address? What is his contact to you? The law should also require that a platform design ensures that e-food offers cannot be published without all mandatory information, even if the marketplace is not made responsible for its security. And finally, regulation should also ensure that platforms establish minimum standards for product delivery. All of this is necessary to ensure that new business models and consumers can take advantages of the possibilities of the platform revolution while ensuring the e-food market is a safe market. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, and we appreciate your comment. And we will now go on to our next public commenter, which is Corey Muse. Corey? Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on a topic that is very important to me as a professional and a consumer. My name is Corey Muse. I am a scientist and the founder of Muse Food Safety Solutions. Food safety is my passion and my profession. I've been in the food industry over 14 years, working and consulting in various roles. Currently, e-commerce encompasses three business models, historical retail establishments, food delivery services, and food businesses that deliver B2C. 
it's important to distinguish the differences as the food safety implications differ drastically. Food delivery services are responsible for the transport of food from restaurant to consumer. The available time window for proliferation of microorganisms and introduction of other hazards is short, typically less than one hour. Additional restaurant establishments have limited on-site storage. PCS ingredients are delivered and utilized within a relatively short window. If the establishment is observing local food safety regulations, the window for proliferation is about six hours. What should be defined as e-com business model is critically different than the aforementioned. Some cook and package their finished products on site while others receive ingredients in portion by hand or equipment and then distribute their products via commercial trucks. These trucks range from private fleets to third-party carriers and in many cases are exempt from thin carry transport rule. Here, the time window for microgrowth is much greater, ranging from 24 to 85 hours or longer. Typically, the packaged food products are shipped on non-temp controlled fleets and in many cases left on a consumer's doorstep for 8 to 10 hours. If this is Nevada in the summer, it could be over 100 degrees. As speakers have demonstrated, we have the data to show that if products are not handled appropriately, there are critical risks to the consumer. Ecom operations are more comparable to food manufacturers, and there is a full lack of federal oversight. They are regulated under local food codes developed for traditional establishments with significantly smaller window for microgrowth and food safety failure. Dr. Hallman highlighted the lack of central registry to reference in the events of an illness outbreak, and others highlighted it's been a complicated task to locate new businesses. It's important to highlight that Facebook is not the answer to this problem. Because of the complexity of e-com business, there must be federal oversight through the appropriate authority. I urge regulatory bodies to require e-com businesses to register with the FDA and require shipment on carriers which fall under sanitary transport rule. I further urge regulators to require scientifically validated temperature controls throughout the supply chain. Companies which are unable to scientifically validate their controls should be required to employ the use of continuous temp monitoring technology to ensure safety. Since ECOM are not currently regulated under FISMA, they're not required to have environmental monitoring for pathogens. This is a critical risk as many businesses handle ready-to-eat foods such as leafy greens and raw produce. I urge regulators to require these e-com businesses to register with the FDA and require environmental monitoring for pathogens. With no federal oversight in mind, I'd like to pose three questions to local regulators. How are local authorities ensuring large volumes of protein are being handled appropriately? And how are local authorities ensuring seafood is being handled appropriately and packaging regulations are being observed? Finally, how are local authorities ensuring that ready-to-eat ingredients are being appropriately classified, stored, and handled? It is paramount solutions are rooted in science and based on risk to mitigate these critical risks that inherently exist with these e-commerce businesses. Regulations for food delivery and traditional retail establishments are grossly inadequate and do not provide the necessary solutions for this rapidly growing business model. I look forward to submitting additional written comments to supplement my comments today. Thank you for your time and allowing me the opportunity. All right, thank you so much for your comments today, your oral comments, and we'll look forward to your written comments submitted to the docket. So thank you for taking the time. We will now go on to our next public commenter, which is Mohammed Shabazz. Mohammed. Uh, hello, good evening uh, from my side. My name is Mohammed Shahbaz. I'm associated with Mawarid Food Company, which is based in Saudi Arabia. First of all, I would like to uh, say many thanks, and it's an honor and privilege for me to be part of this FBA New Era of Smarter Food Safety Summit on e-commerce. And many, many thanks for providing me this uh, amazing opportunity. I would like to comment, as all know, pandemic leaves wide-ranging and catastrophic effects at normal ways of living that has disturbed the global food supply chain and have damaging impact on food safety as well. In this 
challenging time, food industry and the government come together and played vital role to ensure that food sector should remain open for consistent and unhindered production of food so consumers have continued access to safe, healthy and nutritious food during this pandemic. The Food Regulatory Authorities responded quickly and immediately and took initiatives during pandemic. Specifically, FDA formulated regulations, developed precautionary measures, and for specific standard operating procedures and best practices for food sector to keep them safe and healthy even during challenging time. Nowadays, we have seen most of the foods we eat are grown and manufactured in different places and different countries and being delivered to various places by using e-commerce channels. Maybe these channels may be online shopping or home delivery. E-commerce provides consumers with greater choice and convenience and access to food products that they could not access through a traditional way in traditional uh, physical retail trades, trade ways. E-commerce can directly connect small and medium enterprises to the global market, allowing them to extend their sales beyond their limited geographical boundaries and to access small customers as well. Online ordering can be cheaper option as well. Therefore, online ordering has become a favorable way for the consumers to get their safe and healthy meal in very, very convenient way. Here in Saudi Arabia, since last couple of years, we have seen rapid expansion in cloud kitchen, cloud kitchen concepts and selling of various types of food online that is growing tremendously. It's awesome that online selling of food is growing, but we have to ensure that all food delivery aggregate, aggregators are following good hygienic practices and delivering the food to consumers in very, very hygienic and safe way. Once again, thank you very much for, for providing me this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for giving us uh, your evening and, and calling in uh, from Saudi Arabia. I know it's it's quite it's later there, and we so appreciate you joining us uh, for the summit. We'll now go on to our next public commenter, which is Jeannie Duckett. Jeannie? Hi. Hi, thank you. My name is Jeannie Duckett, and I am chair of the Board of Directors for AIM North America. I'm chair of the AIM North America Food Policy Group. I'm convener of the ISO WG8 AIDC and Applications Group. I'm the GS1 co-chair for RFID Gen 2 V3. And my day job is understanding food traceability from farm to fork for Avery Denison. Thank you for allowing me to add public comments during this amazing three-day event for the FDA Summit on e-commerce. I've learned a great deal listening to the different perspectives from the presenters and the other commenters. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear how essential the actions outlined in the blueprint for smarter food safety released in the summer of 2020 are for a safer, more resilient, sustainable, interoperable digital food supply chain. Let's review the four pillars. First, new business models and retail modernization. That's the topic of this week's symposium. Although the concept of new depends on your definition, communal kitchens or ghost kitchens were uncovered in the ruins of Pompeii, and the very first pizza delivery is popularly attributed to Queen Margaret in 1889. After traveling to Naples, she requested food to be delivered to her room, and pizza delivery was born. However, it's more likely that food home delivery dates back as far as communal kitchens. The new challenge for these communal kitchens and third-party delivery services and e-commerce is proving the chain of custody. Simply put, the chain of custody is the unbroken path a product takes from the first stage in the supply chain to the end customer, including raw commodity materials, conversion, transportation, distribution, and logistics. Note that the physical product holder can be different than the product owner. Today, a customer uses a third-party app or a web page to purchase home delivery of food and becomes the immediate owner of that food. However, they do not have possession of it. Third-party apps have proprietary methods of capturing this data, but the new era, era pillar will be enabled through common access. This brings us to our next pillar, enhanced traceability. There is a global interoperability model currently in use in the drug supply chain, and it's starting to emerge in food. Commoners have referred to it on each day. 
let's look at what's required. First, you need definition. You need the critical tracking events. These events flow nicely from the food process map required for hazmat analysis. As discussed, that made its appearance in the 1960s. A common language builds common understanding. The common language is EPCIS, defined by the GS1 and ratified by ISO. In the coming months, food safety experts will assist in defining these points for communal kitchens and delivery services. Secure access. This model is being developed by the Internet Consortium, W3C, as decentralized identification. For the practitioner in the field, it's obvious that not all of this data is going to be stored in a single repository. This is neither practical or desirable. Decentralized identification will enable permission to access to this data with verifiable credentials. Providence certificate and sensor data. A common method was needed for the verification of the certificate and evidence that HAZMAT controls were met. EPCIS standard 2.0 is now in community review, and this enables this data to be tied to the item moving through the supply chain. Building on this foundation, you'll see that the digital food supply chain rapidly emerged in over the next decade with automatic exception handling based upon unmet control points. Which brings us to the new culture of food safety and another emerging standard, GS1 Digital Link. GS1 Digital Link is building upon all of the web-enabled references that have developed over the last decade from proprietary QR codes. The GS1 Digital Link is a structured way of web enabling GS1 data, such as Global Data Model or EPCIS. Imagine a third-party delivery service creating an EPCIS event that builds upon the previous events that an item was picked up and delivered to a consumer in an appropriate transportation environment with a tamper-proof label on it. The GS1 Digital Link containing a QR code on the package to not only tie the brand directly to the product and the consumer, provide verified nutrition and allergy information, as well maybe a coupon for the third-party delivery service. Within this framework, you can educate while regulating. The GS1 digital link could link safe food handling practices. In the case of a recall, the GS1 digital link with verifiable conventionals could enable the access to the unbroken chain of custody for the product for rapid trace back and trace forward. To wrap up, we've discussed how global interoperable standards can enable the access of food safety information, allergens, nutrition facts, product handling, and enable third-party deliveries to offer value add to both restaurants and consumers. With interoperable traceability events, we enable the final pillar of the new era smarter uh, tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response to enable that quick trace back. Thank you. And thank you, Jeannie, for both your technical remarks, and I have to say I enjoyed your historical notes as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and I want to thank again all of our public commenters. That uh, does bring us to the end of our open public comment session this afternoon. And at this time, I do want to welcome back our summit host, Andreas Keller. Andreas? Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to us for throughout these three days. Dear audience, over the past three days, we learned so much about what is being done to help ensure the safety of food produced and sold through B2C commerce, as well as thinking from many different perspectives on where potential regulatory gaps may exist and what opportunities exist to better protect consumers. During today's summit sessions, we learned how some of our international food safety partner agencies regulate B2C e-commerce and the challenges they face. The challenges we face in the U.S. are similar to those faced by other countries further highlighting the need to collaborate and exchange information about how best to ensure the safety of these foods and how to manage food safety problems once discovered. And how countries provide executive oversight, strategic leadership, and policy. We have reached the end of our summit. It has been an interesting and informative few days. I want to thank all of those that participated in this summit, where they participated as panelists, submitted questions, or just listened into, a, into learn about the potential safety issues which attach to B2C commerce and foods. 
while the summit is almost over, the dialogue on food sold via e-commerce will continue. As we have said throughout the summit, we intend to use information resulting from this public meeting as well as all submissions to the docket, which will remain open until November 20th, to determine what action, if any, should be taken to help ensure the safe productions and delivery of food sold through new e-commerce business models. We urge you to think about the issues raised over the last three days as well as those highlighted in the Federal Register Notice and background materials for the summit that were posted on our website and provide us with any data and other information which you might have that can help us in our deliberations and how to improve the safety of foods produced, sold, and delivered through e-commerce. So, what are our next steps? As I said, FDA will be reviewing all the information we heard over the last few days, the public comments provided us, and other feedback received. We will work in collaboration with our state and local partners, as well as all our stakeholders, other than in the federal and U.S., so that we incorporate all international levels as well. To continue the dialogue, we are technical follow-up on discussions and potential other forums as needed to determine the path forward. Please share the summit YouTube links for all three days with your peers and friends, and you may also follow our progress as www.fda.gov backslash food backslash new era of smarter food safety. I urge you to sign up for the subscription service on our website so you can be kept up to date on all developments related to the new era of smarter food safety and learn of future opportunities to get involved. We thank you again for your interest and participation this week. All of us, whether regulators, industry, consumer groups, or academia, share a common interest in ensuring the safety of food sold through e-commerce and together we will work to protect consumers. We wish you an enjoyable rest of your day. Goodbye and stay safe.